Anderson, professor of bioengineering and professor of applied physics at Stanford University. He's also the co-president of the Chan Zuckerberg Biohub. He received in he received his bachelor's in physics and and master's in mathematics from Stanford University in 91, and a doctorate in theoretical physics from the University of Oxford in 94. He began his faculty career at the California Institute of Technology in 96, where he rose through the ranks to become the Everhart Professor of Applied Physics and Physics. He joined Stanford in 2005 to help found and lead Stanford's new bioengineering department as it grew to nearly two dozen faculty members. He was simultaneously an investigator of the Howard Hughes Medical Institute from 2006 to 2016. Um, he has won many awards. His honors include Human Frontiers of Science Nicholson Prize, the MIT Lemelson Prize, Raymond Beverly Sackler International Prize in Biophysics, and others. He is elected fellow of the National Academy of Sciences, National Academy of Engineering, National Academy of Medicine, American Academy of Arts and Sciences, National Academy of Inventors, the American Institute for Medical and Biological Engineering and the Amer American Physical Society. Uh, the floor is yours, sir. Thank you so much for having me. And uh, I wish I was there in person to see the Terasaki Institute, but I'll, uh, I'll, I'll defer that to my next visit to LA and we're, I feel like we're almost back um, for that sort of thing. Can you guys see my screen? Yes. Yes, great. So I'm gonna to talk today about the work we've done building single cell transcriptomic atlases of entire organisms. And, um, you know, it's based on a lot of fun technology, some of which I had a hand in developing, and then we'll talk about that a little bit. Um, and, you know, it's also kind of at a meta level based on this view, uh, this sort of very physics inspired view of biology. And I try to capture that in the title, the cell is a bag of RNA. Um, and uh, I wrote a little essay about that, which published in Trends in Genetics last month. Um, they changed the title to The Cell as a Bag of RNA. That works too. Um, but it sort of captures this idea, I think, of, uh, of, of, of trying to abstract the cell in a way that um, uh, not entirely accurate in some ways, but in other ways gives you insights you wouldn't have had otherwise. And you know, the inspiration comes from... Uh, this sort of long running argument between biochemists and cell biologists. And, you know, they argued for half a century about what's the right mental picture of a cell. Is it a bag of enzymes, which is sort of the way the biochemists wanted to think about it? Or is it this collection of complex structures and compartments, which is how the cell biologists thought about it. Um, and, uh, you know, obviously it's more than a bag of enzyme and there are structures and compartments and they all matter. Um, but this idea of abstracting it and having as your mental picture, all that matters are the enzymes, and let's then go figure out when we purify the enzymes and work out what their activity is in a test tube and try and use that to understand how the cell works was extremely powerful. And you know, all the great insights that came from you know, understanding uh, you know, the polymerases and restriction enzymes and everything else came about from that biochemical view. And you know, it's hard to imagine them happening without it. Um, if you'd stayed and insisted that you had to take on all the complexity of the cell at once, probably would never have gotten there. And so um, this, this, this idea of abstraction is super powerful. Um, and uh, what I'm going to do is take it this idea of a bag of RNA um, and, and talk to you about how we're using that as a tool and a, and a mental picture to unravel the nature of cellular state and cellular identity. Um, and so this very particular specific set of questions um, ends up being powerfully answered by this abstraction. Um, and uh, what we found over the last um, well, decade, I suppose, that identity, cellular identity as described and defined by the transcriptome has a remarkably close relationship to identity as defined conventionally by physiology as cell biologists have been doing for more than a century. And moreover, that taking this to sort of big science and building these large scale atlases of single cell transcriptomes, they're like a phenotypic companion to the genome, both in the sense that they're providing a molecular definition of cell type and also help interpret how the genome is used in different cell types. And that's really important. You know, people talk about the genome as being the blueprint of the organism, but it's really not for any multicellular organism. It's more like a parts list and not all parts are used 
in all cell types of the organism. And so um, the cell atlases are like a blueprint that explain how different parts are used in different cell types. And uh, they're a very powerful complement to the genome in that respect. And they go hand in hand together. Um, now the way we do these measurements today has become uh, pretty straightforward. Um, and I'll, I'll walk you through how we do it and talk a bit about some of the technologies behind it a little bit, um, <clears throat> just so we're all kind of calibrated. Uh, and the basic idea of all these experiments is the same. You take your tissue, you cut it out, you, in most cases, will dissociate it to single cells, so they're there in a test tube. Then you go through this process of, of sort of cellular isolation and lysis and amplification of the transcriptome with molecular barcodes attached so that every cell has its own unique barcode. And there's different ways to do that. Most of them involve microfluidics in one form or another. Um, uh, and I'll talk about that technology. Uh, then once you've done that, you combine all those libraries together and you sequence them using next generation sequencing, at which point you get out at the end of the day for every cell, a 20,000 dimensional vector. So it's sitting there in gene expression space in the mouse or the human genome, there's roughly 20,000 genes. And each cell is represented by a vector in that high dimensional space where every entry in the vector tells you how many transcripts of that gene were expressed in the cell. Okay. And that's a, a very complex, interesting object, and you've got a lot of them because there's one for each cell. And uh, so what comes next is, is uh, uh, a series of computational steps that help you understand the relationships between those cells and their expression vectors. And uh, what you'll often see here are kind of reduced dimensionality representations, which I've shown here under the computation line, um, where every dot represents a different single cell in that 20,000 dimensional space. Um, and their relationships have been mapped in 20,000 dimensions through clustering. That's what the colors represent. And then they're represented in this reduced dimensionality, two dimensions here, by things like principal component analysis, TISNI, UMAP. There's a whole suite of dimensional reduction algorithms that are, that are used to do that and, and are an important part of rendering the data and helping sift through and understand what it means. So that's kind of the outline of how these things go. Let me talk a bit about a couple of the technologies along the way. Um, so one is how you think about the modern sequencer and uh, sequencing has gone through a revolution in the last couple of decades, um, basically driven by going from a process that was primarily analytical chemistry to a process that's mostly biophysical. And the picture you should have in your head about what a modern sequencer is, is that it's a fluorescence microscope attached to a dishwasher. Um, and uh, that's really what it is. It's no magic. It's not that complicated. It's just a bunch of automated fluidics around a fluorescence microscope. And all the readout of the sequence data happens through fluorescence microscopy. And that's how most of the platforms work. There's some variations on that, um, but I'd say the vast majority of sequencers are working this way. And you know, if you want to learn a bit more about how all this came about and how it's impacted health, I can recommend uh, a really lovely book written by my friend and collaborator, Ewan Ashley, called The Genome Odyssey, which published earlier this year, and tells the story about how he and a bunch of people at Stanford began thinking about how to use these sequencers in medicine, um, in personal genomes. And the story of my genome and how it's sequenced and annotated is the first chapter of the book. You learn a bit about me as well. Um, the other tools, as I mentioned, are for the sort of cellular encapsulation and and processing. And as I mentioned, many of these are microfluidics, and this has been an area of my own research for a long time. Um, and, you know, we've thought a lot about microfluidics as the integrated circuit of biology and figured out ways to create these chips with tens of thousands of micromechanical valves on them. Um, and have used that kind of fluidic automation technology to explore a bunch of different problems over the years, including how to do single cell genomics. Um, and you know, I founded a company early on uh, that called Fluidime, and uh, they developed the first commercial microfluidic tools for doing single cell genomics. Uh, and, uh, uh, and now the space has become more uh, populated. There's, there, there's a lot of other choices, but uh, you know, this gives you a sense of where it all started and, uh, and the scale at which they were able to manufacture these devices. You know, at some point 10 years ago, they'd worked out that they'd fabricated more than a billion of these valves, um, which is more than all the conventional plumbing found in California, Texas, New York put together. And the power of miniaturization and scaled manufacturing. Now the other microfluidic technology that's very widely used these days for single cell genomics 
is uh, droplets or little water and oil emulsions. And this is something that we first developed in my lab, actually, uh, about the same time we were doing the valves as kind of another route to doing uh, microfluidic manipulation. And Todd Thorson, who was my PhD student at the time, shown there. Uh, and we had the idea of using these as biochemical reactors. And then uh, uh, they become, that sort of spun off a very exciting subfield of microfluidics where there's been all kinds of great work and advances by other folks over the years, um, including leading to what is now, I'd say the most widely used microfluidic technology for single cell genomics, um, that of 10X genomics, which I'm not involved in as a company. Um, my, my involvement was a long time ago. So, uh, in summarizing that in schematics and some of the early papers to, to point you at it, the, the valve-based approaches um, that were commercial by Fluidime were shown here, um, where you have lots of different chambers and valves, you have very controlled defined volumes, you have multiple steps. These are kind of the highest sensitivity ways, um, not yet surpassed actually uh, for doing single cell genomics. Uh, and the reasons for that are sort of interesting. Um, there's ways of, of kind of doing fax-based cell sorters and sorting cells into multi-well plates, um, which Mike Clark and I were doing for uh, highly parallel uh, transcriptome amplification of hundreds of genes. Ricard Sandberg and uh, Sten Linnerson and others developed ways of doing it uh, with whole transcriptome amplification, and that's become very powerful. Um, goes by the name of SmartSeq and, and, and SortSeq and things like that. Um, we do a fair bit of that as well. The cell sorter we like to use actually has a as its integral component, a microfluidic device. And so uh, there's microfluidics in the ways that we do this. And, um, uh, and this has become, uh, that, that Sony cell sorter has been kind of a workhorse. And there's the droplets, which as I mentioned, you know, we kind of kicked that off a long time ago. Dave Waits and uh, folks at Harvard and, uh, and, and MIT and the Broad kind of figured out how to take that into the single cell transcriptomics area. And then, as I mentioned, uh, the most powerful commercial instantiation is with 10X. And we use, in my lab, all three of these approaches these days. They each have different strengths and weaknesses. Broadly speaking, uh, the, the fluidime approach is highest sensitivity, but lowest throughput. The droplet approach is highest throughput, lower sensitivity. The fax is somewhere in between. Um, and, you know, all, all useful in different contexts. So uh, Angela Wu, uh, who was a student of mine at the time, now professor at uh, Hong Kong University of Science Technology, um, uh, kind of early on got interested in trying to show how well you could do in terms of absolute quantitation, began to do spike-ins with ERCC-defined uh, controls. So these are from NIST. Um, these are defined RNA standards where the same people who define the second and the kilogram uh, also have been interested in biological metrology and will give you test tubes with defined numbers of RNA molecules in them with defined sequences. And we use those standards and would spike them into our single cell experiments to show that uh, you can actually, um, in aggregate, get very good absolute quantitation. Um, each dot here is an average over 100 single cell experiments. And, and so on average, you're getting several logs of, of absolute quantitation. Even as you'll notice, down below one molecule per reaction, so zero on the x-axis on a log scale is one molecule per experiment. <laughs> and you can see that uh, as we average over those 100 experiments, all the Poisson statistics work out and, and, and help contribute to the dynamic range. Um, let me take you through some examples of how we have used these techniques. Um, uh, first, in kind of very specific uh, experiments designed to address uh, uh, a given biological question, and then in the latter part of the talk, I'll talk about how we've been making these larger cell atlases um, and putting them together um, with the aid of very large collaborations and the resources of the Biohub. So the first example I'm going to talk about um, is one relating to the immune system uh, and allergy as an immune disorder. Um, and uh, uh, as you might know, uh, if you've got an allergy, it's driven by a particular class of antibodies called IgE, um, uh, which uh, uh, end up uh, getting a little bit off track um, and, and making things go haywire. And the cells that make IgE are extraordinarily rare um, in humans. And it turned out that nobody had been able to purify them from individual humans before until we set out to do it using um, some tricks from single cell transcriptomics. And uh, by we here, I mean uh, 
Kari Nadau, who's a collaborator at Stanford. She runs the Parker Allergy Clinic and has been a pioneer in developing approaches to both understand food allergies and to treat people with allergies, desensitize them. And she herself wrote a terrific book if you're interested in, in allergies and how it's now, you know, what had been a backwater is now a very exciting field with lots of technological innovation. Um, she wrote a terrific book about that recently called The End of Food Allergy. And uh, the actual work was done by my then student, Derek Crute, who was a PhD student in my lab. Um, so what we did um, was to uh, take blood from individuals with food allergies who have higher levels of IgE um, than do uh, uh, healthy folks. Um, so there's a boost right there because we know they have more IgE producing cells. And then we did single cell sorts using surface markers. And we would sort of counterintuitively set the gates to be very sloppy. Um, because we wanted to get sensitivity and we were okay getting um, impure populations because obviously we weren't getting populations. We were getting single cell sorted. Um, and some of them would hopefully be IgE producing B cells, others would be different types. Um, but this was one of these sort of essential tricks that when you're doing single cell transcriptomics, uh, you don't need to have your fax gates set so tightly that, that you're getting pure populations because you can work all that out afterwards informatically. Um, so we did that did this single cell RNA-seq, did analysis of the transcriptomes to understand uh, you know, sort, of, uh, a sort of molecular definition of these cells and, and their different uh, flavors um, in terms of sub, subtypes. And then we also, because we would get out of that, the full sequence of the, of the heavy and light chains of the antibodies, uh, we synthesized them, cloned them, expressed them, and measured the properties of the antibodies. Uh, and so this shows some of the transcriptome data um, broadly, uh, uh, the, the, uh, just looking at the whole transcriptome relationships, they'd separate into two clusters and how we identified them later through uh, which uh, genes were expressed uniquely in one versus the other was that the red population are the naive and memory cells and the blue are the plasma blasts that are pumping out huge numbers of antibodies. And you can see through these markers um, that it sort of makes sense. Um, <clears throat> with sort of known biology of uh, the known markers for, for those populations. And then we also got uh, uh, cells from a number of different isotypes um, because again, the, the gates were set pretty wide. And so uh, we got not just IgE, but also IgA, IgG, IgD, IgM, and we could analyze their expression um, and, uh, uh, and their transcriptomes as well. Now, focusing on IgE, which we knew were the important ones for allergies, um, we made some really interesting discoveries, which I'm going to sort of summarize here in just one or two slides. Um, and if you're interested, welcome to go back and read the paper. Um, but one is um, that there were some interesting examples of convergent evolution, um, where two different individuals um, had evolved almost exactly the same IgE sequences, which is a sign of, you know, some sort of very strong selection going on. And you can see that here, um, in particular in clonal family one, CF1, where this is a complicated uh, 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 little diagram where the shape of each symbol tells you which patient it came from. So you can see in clonal family one, you've got both squares and triangles. And those are two different patients, patients 12 and 13. Um, and so uh, they had sequences in the same clonal family. Size of the object is sort of amount of mutation and color is isotype. So these IgE with conversion evolution. Um, and so that was a sign that something really interesting was going on here. So we, we really drilled down on that family, um, but also expressed some of the others as well. And what we found was that the majority of, of, of these antibodies were gonna bind to the antigen. These were all people who were derived from people who were allergic to peanuts. Um, and uh, at least roughly half the antibodies were binding to peanut, um, which was, or peanut proteins, um, which are shown below here. So those are the, uh, uh, the ELISAs. Um, showing that uh, uh, they're all hitting ARH2 really strongly and several are cross-reactive with ARH3. Um, none are hitting BSA and the controls are all making sense. And so um, and, you know, what this means is that essentially in effect, we have a platform here to discover fully humanized antibodies against any substance that humans are allergic to. So in this case, we found a bunch of antibodies that are peanut specific and we went, we've gone on since then and found uh, many other allergen specific antibodies. Um, so these clonal family one, returning to that, um, I mentioned uh, the converged evolution aspects and you can see how similar the sequences are uh, in, the, in the CDR3. Um, and these are also 
very highly mutated. They're highly evolved antibodies. And you can see in the sort of cumulative fraction, they're way at the end in terms of mutation frequency. So these are ones that um, you know, are not accidents the bodies work pretty hard on. And you know, what this has pointed us to is a potential approach to a new therapeutic strategy to cure allergies, which is to say, we're gonna take these peanut specific antibodies and change the isotype. So we express them now as, we're gonna express them as IgG4. And if you then administer those to humans, um, in principle, they'll be able to compete against the endogenous IgE, uh, bind the food and sort of provide prophylactic protection against uh, food allergy anaphylaxis. That's the theory. Um, and you know, we're uh, very excited to see if any of this is gonna go anywhere. Kari and Derek and I founded a company called uh, I Hygienics, which is trying to take all this in the clinic and work that out. And we'll see. It's, it's, it's some years away, but uh, they're, they're off to an excellent start. So let me tell you about another story, again, using single cell transcriptomics to understand an aspect of human biology, which is fascinating and important and, uh, and sort of hard to study in model organisms. Um, so Menstruation, of course, is a monthly modeling, shedding, and regeneration of the endometrium, which is essential for fertility. Um, it's shared really only with a few other primates. And you know that the, the biology behind this is, is really quite human specific and the model organisms are, are, are very far off um, in, in how they handle uh, reproduction. And so uh, you know, we got interested in trying to study this in humans. Um, and then as a, you know, part of the potential application of doing that is trying to understand how to characterize the ideal moment in time to do in vitro fertilization. And you know, how could you improve the success rates of IVF and would information about sort of molecular definition of all the cell types in the cycle be useful in doing that was a question we wanted to ask. And here uh, uh, by we, I mean uh, our terrific collaborators, Carlos Simon and Felipe Vallea, who uh, down at Harvard University, previously in, in Spain, um, and, and uh, my student, then student Wan Xin Wang, who's now a postdoc at UCSF. And so Carlos and Felipe were able to obtain endometrial biopsies from 19 women, all at different points in the phase. Each woman contributed one biopsy, and they had, you know, part of their study been knowing exactly what day in the phase those women were. And so uh, you can see we were able to uh, get samples th throughout the cycle. Um, and for each of those, Wan Shin did uh, uh, single cell transcriptomic measurements, in this case on Fluidimes instrument. And uh, this was published in Nature Medicine recently. So again, I'll just give you sort of the highlights. If you're interested, you can dig into the details. Um, but you can see here that the cells are all um, taken all together now um, in this clustering and then dimensional reduction. You can see that they're all separating. Um, and there's stromal cells, there's immune cells. If you subcluster in the immune, you can see macrophage, lymphocyte, you can see endothelial cells and epithelial cells. And you know, there's this funky little subcluster of the epithelial cells that when we dug down into that and studied them, discovered uh, that they were quite different in the sense that they were expressing genes related to cilia and creating and maintaining cilia. Um, and uh, what we realized was we had found the first molecular evidence for a long hypothesized uh, cell type of the ciliated epithelial in the endometrium. And, you know, predictions for that have been going back for decades based on electron microscopy of pathological tissue. And we sort of first ones to find it in normal tissue and to find the molecular program there behind it. Um, and so here you can see that uh, for the various cell types that were shown before, the color code is on the top. Uh, there are clearly genes that are specifically defining each cell type, um, um, including the ciliated epithelia. Um, and then now when you start adding time on as a variable, because remember, we can start to think about how these are changing through the course of the monthly cycle. Um, here, for example, on the left are the, uh, uh, the epithelial and on the right, the stromal cells. And uh, uh, the coloring is, uh, in this case, pseudo time, which we've derived as, as, a, as a sort of as a metric related to actual time, you can see on the right that pseudo time and, and actual time do map very well. And the details for that, I'm not going to dwell on. But uh, you can see that there's a continuous defined trajectory through this space over the course of the over the course of the cycle um, for both cell types. And now, at the end of the day, you can start to ask at the level of gene expression, individual genes for both of these cell types, epithelial and stromal, 
can we start to uh, uh, identify um, across time uh, the kind of uh, conventional pathological phases or, or physiological phases defined in the textbook and lay those over what we now have as molecular data in each of these cell types? And the answer is yes, we can do that. And we can identify what we think is the window of implantation shown up on top there with the arrow. Um, where there's a very defined difference in gene expression. And that's where we think would be kind of the optimal time to do implantation and uh, have a variety of ideas of how we measure that, um, potentially non-invasively. Um, but now it, we, we sort of know what to look for, which is a good starting point. Okay. Um, so as a third, and this is, I think, going to be the final example of, of an individual experiment, um, we are interested in uh, using this approach to understand uh, a bit more about the molecular nature of memory. Um, and uh, it's been known for decades that uh, RNA synthesis is necessary for forming memories. And Eric Kendall, of course, uh, one of the Nobel laureates for discovering that. And he did it by working in uh, a great model organism, a plesia sea slug, um, which gigantic neurons and all kinds of interesting uh, uh, aspects of its, uh, make it experimentally tractable. Um, one of which, as he points out, is that you can record from single cells and get mRNA from single cells. Um, and so, you know, the value of single cell genomics <laughs> been appreciated a long time. Um, and this is one very nice early example of that, uh, well before the development of modern sequencers and all that, and these other technologies that allow us to do it at scale in human and mouse. Um, it was done in model organisms to, to powerful effect. Um, and uh, what we decided to do was go out of a sea slug and go to a model that's a little closer to human physiology, which is to say mouse. Um, and, uh, uh, and here by we, I mean Tom Sudoff uh, and uh, his then postdoc, Shan Zhang, my then postdoc, Michelle Chen. Uh, Michelle's now at Genentech. Shan is about to take a faculty position in uh, Shenzhen, um, and to use uh, uh, contextual fear conditioning, um, and to ask about not formation short and recall short-term memory, but long-term memory. So, what happens after a couple of weeks, and you know things have consolidated, and then you ask again um, uh, to pull that memory out? How is RNA involved in that process? So, not initial learning, but long-term recall. Um, and you know. There, Again, ton of clever sort of biology here, um, which uh, for reasons of time, I can go into the paper was published in Nature last year. You can read all the details. Um, but uh, 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 sort of in summary, um, we use this very clever mouse developed by Leach and Lowe called the trap mouse, um, which uh, uses Cree locks to, to lock in and label certain cell types at a certain moment. And so uh, you, can, uh, uh, you can train them uh, and then uh, in that sort of two weeks later, uh, when you do the recall, you give them tamoxifen and any neurons that get excited then will become fluorescent um, and then uh, and be permanently express GFP. So we can then uh, sacrifice the mice and pull out those fluorescent neurons that were excited in the memory recall event and, uh, and analyze their transcriptomes. Um, and uh, we did that um, and discovered that uh, there are a bunch of very interesting genes that uh, are uh, exhibiting these really sustained transcriptional sig signatures due to recall. Um, and look at the ones that saw fear and ones that didn't see fear and lots of interesting control experiments. Again, I won't go into them. Um, but uh, in these populations, um, these genes uh, make a lot of sense biologically. So for example, we see this high enrichment for uh, vesicle exocytosis signatures upregulated, upregulated and you know, these genes here make a lot of sense. These are the things that, you know, you want to be firing as you're pulling back the, the memory and, uh, and continuing to consolidate it over time. So um, it's, it's, it's kind of, a, uh, I think, a very powerful approach to neuroscience and now connecting the bag of RNA idea to very deep questions about physiology and, and, and how the brain works and, and, and to the biochemistry behind it. And you can see that all these things work together. You combine the the, uh, the ability to do single cell transcriptomics with these very powerful genetic models um, uh, where you're able to, uh, to physiologically change the, the neurons that are involved in different physiological events and, and, and have them be read out later.
Um, and we've gone on uh, in, in to other fun applications of neuroscience. Um, in this case, looking at evolution of brain structures, which I won't dwell on. The paper came out earlier this year, and um, and again combined many different aspects of measurement, um, but uh, single cell transcriptomics playing an important role in all that. Um, so let's now in the last in the in the last bit of the talk uh, get to some of these larger scale experiments of trying to create atlases and public resources that, uh, as I say, are, are in many ways companions to the genome. Um, and with the resources of the Biohub, um, we've been able to go after this and do this and develop ways of, of, of doing these experiments at scale. Um, the first ones we did were in mouse. Um, and the first we did a single time point of mouse, the three month age of mouse, where we looked at, I don't know, some 18 different organs and tissues and and did single cell transcriptomics on all of them, and then did mouse as a function of age, um, which we called, first one was tabula muris of age, tabula muris senis, map of the aging mouse, um, and did this in collaboration with terrific folks, Tony Whiskeray at Stanford, uh, and within the Biohub, Spiros Dermanis and Angela Pisco played important roles among, you know, these papers had more than 100 authors and a uh, large set of collaborators at Stanford and UCSF, along the way, um, because the way we went about it was to um, take all the tissues from the same mouse. And so um, the aged mice are hard to get a hold of. And so each mouse we sacrificed, we'd use all 18 tissues from that mouse. And uh, I don't know if I have a picture of that here. Here we go. So what had happened was, you know, over the course of a summer, we, you know, <laughs> every morning we're sacrificing a mouse um, from the different age cohorts. This group of students and postdocs would come all from different labs who had expertise in the different tissues. They'd wait with their ice buckets, take their tissue back to their lab, do the dissociation, in some case sorting and prep. Then we'd bring everything back to the biohub where the group below did all the sequencing, uh, library prep and sequencing. Um, and Norman Neff, who led our, leads our genomics platform and Jim Kirkanius, who leads our data science platform, played important roles in all of that. And so it was this great collaboration um, uh, between groups with tissue expertise and groups with kind of the high throughput aspect and then when everything was sequenced, the tissue experts all went back and annotated uh, the cells from their tissue. And so this is like the largest data set of expert annotated uh, single cells uh, in the world. It's been heavily used as a result of that. People who want to develop algorithms to benchmark, you know, do automated things, they benchmark it to our results. Um, and so a lot of interesting things came out. Um, I'll just highlight a couple here for you. Again, papers are published. They're long and dense and deep. Interest in aging, a lot of fun stuff there. Um, but, you know, as one might expect, um, senescent cells are increasing with age. And so if you look at cells that are expressing CDK and 2A, um, not only are the number of cells expressing that uh, marker for senescence increasing with age, but the intensity of that marker is, is increasing as well. So in each of those cells, there's higher expression level with age. Um, and we use this to drive a whole bunch of other genes related to senescence. And the literature had been very confused on that point um, in finding those associated genes. They weren't even sure if they're going up or down with senescence. And we were able to disentangle uh, some of that. Um, another thing we looked at was uh, mutations with age. There's been a lot of interesting literature about that. Um, uh, you, every cell division, you accumulate a couple mutations. Um, there's evidence that that increases with age. We were able to go see that. Um, in our single cell data uh, by looking at mutations in the transcripts. Um, and uh, again, sort of interesting uh, analysis there, but you can see that um, uh, the older the mouse, the higher number of mutations uh, across not just all cells, but even within cell types, it happens across every cell type we looked at. And you can reference it to those ERCC spiking controls, which we included in these experiments. And those did not have any change in mutation with age, thank goodness. So we know it's not a technical artifact. Um, and then uh, the, the, the third paper in the series, which is not yet published, but which you can read on BioArchive, um, is to do a functional study of, of, of rejuvenation and accelerated aging using a technique called parabiosis. And so this is something that means sort of living beside as a laboratory te technique to study physiology. And what you do is you surgically attach two organisms together. So they share the same uh, blood supply and blood flow. Um, and uh, through many years, um, folks like Tony and Tom Rando and others have been able to show that when you, you do parabiosis between a young mouse and an old mouse, 
the old mouse becomes rejuvenated and shows some physiological aspects of youth and reversed aging, and the young mouse appears to, to age faster um, than if you do parabiosis between pairs of young mice um, or pairs of old mice. So we decided to try to get to the molecular basis of this, and so built a single cell transcromic atlas, transcromic atlas of the different uh, uh, versions of parabiosed mice. Um, and uh, again, uh, we could compare that, um, both the kind of rejuvenation effects and the accelerated aging with the actual aged mice we had done in the work I described previously and discovered that, you know, it's largely consistent um, that, uh, uh, you know, rejuvenation is the opposite of aging, but accelerated aging, um, you know, the signs all work out um, for many different genes and many different cell types is not perfect, but it's pretty good. And so, uh, you know, the way to read this very complicated figure out is that, you know, blue means uh, that parabiosis is consistent with age and that, you know, either accelerated aging is the same as natural aging or the rejuvenation is the reverse sign of actual aging and red is not consistent in one way or another. And you can see there's a lot of consistency across it, especially with genes that are downregulated with age. The ones upregulated with age, a little less consistency, but still there's quite a bit of evidence there. And as you sort of dig in and start to say what's happening at the molecular level and what do you see consistently in rejuvenation and accelerated aging that is true across different cell types, um, well, this sort of electron transport and energy ends up, you know, being the thing that, that jumps out as most consistently seen across many, many different cell types and, and is such seems to be the central part of the, of, of the, of the rejuvenation and aging story. Okay, so that was mouse. Um, and as we published mouse and, and people had realized that we'd figure out this way of doing whole organism atlases at scale, um, uh, there was a lot of interest in it. And we were approached by the Drosophila community um, who had uh, wanted to do a cell atlas and were interested in doing it at scale, didn't have the expertise um, in, in the specific parts of single cell transcriptomics. And so we agreed to teach them how to do what we did. Um, and they're very nice international collaboration came together. You can see the names of the folks involved. Um, and they chose a very similar approach where uh, different labs would dissect the flies and pull out different individual tissues. Um, and, uh, and those would be analyzed separately and annotated. And there was a very nice sort of informatic team and, jam and expert annotation of this through a jamboree. So that again, huge amount of hand curation of the data. Um, Here's an example uh, of body wall, thorax or abdomen and abdomen. Um, you can see um, you know, all the different cell types within those that tissue. Um, you can see they're given names here because of the annotation. And whereas before these would have been, these cell types would have been defined by just one or two genes um, as the marker genes. Now for each of them, we have the full transcriptomic profile and a much larger set of markers that are unique to each one and and uh and and we'll define them and and just you can see the sort of power of it through all this um i'll uh I'll, this is just kind of the the one to, to to show you the whole thing there's there's several hundred thousand cells uh hundreds of different cell types that have been annotated and it's just a we think going to be a very terrific resource for the fly community this is also available on bioarchive um and the data is available through websites if you want to uh, play with it, um, and we expect it will be published shortly. Um, another one we did, um, uh, which kind of, again, kind of started from the mouse work, was to do lemur, um, which is a non-human primate. And there's a very interesting lemur species called the mouse lemur, which despite being called a mouse lemur, it's actually a lemur and, and it's a primate, um, not a rodent, um, which is found in Madagascar, uh, and uh, which one of our tissue experts uh, from the mouse project, Mark Krasnow has been studying as a model organism and trying to develop it as a new model organism for biology. And he goes to Madagascar every year to study them, to work with Pat Wright and others there. Um, but it also established a colony at Stanford. And uh, uh, a few of his lemurs had to be euthanized because they were getting old and sick and the vets said it's time to euthanize. And we decided to uh, opportunistically use that to, to build a lemur cell atlas, um, which we've done. Uh, again, about a quarter million cells from 30 different tissues, done the same way we did the mouse, same expert tissue team, same expert annotation. Um, and, uh, and that is something that we 
released the data earlier this year. You're welcome to play with it um, through any of our, uh, through our BioHub portal, and hopefully the paper will be submitted shortly. Um, and provides a very interesting evolutionary intermediate point between rodent and human. And that leads us to human, um, which we've also gone after and done, led by uh, Bob Jones in my lab as the ringleader, several other faculty PIs, again, you know, sort of 160 authors on the paper. Um, it's a large project. We decided to publish, we're not done with it. This is sort of uh, what we're aiming to do. Um, and uh, we decided to uh, uh, publish our, our first set of data because we had enough for it to be interesting. Um, and so there's a first paper on the way. It's on BioArchive as a draft. The data has been released and uh, 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 it's, it's uh, um, I think, in, uh, in very good shape and we're hoping to be published uh, uh, later this year. Um, and here, going after two dozen different tissues from individual donors um, and doing both uh, kind of the, the droplet and the sort seek method. So we're getting both the power of both sets of data on it. Um, and uh, again, uh, you know, if you're interested, go to the Tabula Sapiens website at the BioHub. Here's, you know, the first two pilot donors with uh, one with six organs, one with 18, and another eight organs that were obtained through through individual practices from, from separate donors or sort of just one tissue per donor. And you can see how uh, cell types are distributed across all these different tissues um, and uh, ways of taking the data. Um, and so this is kind of a high level view. We've done a much more in-depth analysis, which uh, you're welcome to read in the preprint and bio archive to, to get a sense for where it all is. And um, as I'm kind of running out of time, I just want to be sure we're acknowledging all the folks who contributed. This is truly team science. Um, here's pictures of many of the folks involved in the in the mouse and the lemur and the human as well. Um, in the human, you can see that it's, uh, uh, this is the group kind of that, that masterminds that when the donor comes in, it's like an all nighter. And they're, you know, kind of uh, tissues coming from the surgery suite and, you know, going to the different labs, everything comes back to be sorted at the bio hub. And uh, it's a very, very dedicated group of people who are, who are willing to do this. And without them, it, it wouldn't be possible. And it's been a lot of fun to do it all together. Um, so with that, I think I'll, I'll wind down and I'm happy to take any, take any questions. And I'll return to this slide, which I shared earlier in the talk that, you know, I hope, I hope I've been able to convince you that, uh, that this view of the cell as a bag of RNA is a powerful abstraction that's helping us understand some really fundamental questions about cell biology that we wouldn't get other ways. And I, I've shared with you both kind of very specific questions and projects we've done, kind of small scale things at the single lab level, as well as larger efforts to create resources for the community um, to use. And uh, as my last slide, I'll just say that, um, you know, we've, there's many other stories um, uh, that my lab has been involved in over the years using these techniques, both developing them and applying those specific questions in neuroscience, infectious disease, uh, development, cancer, um, and not just looking at the transcriptome, but also looking at the genome and, and the epigenome, um, uh, all of which are exciting areas. And, and uh, uh, there's, there's a tremendous amount of work going on in this field across the world. It's a super exciting time to be involved in it. And with that, I'll stop and say thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you for this uh, exciting talk, Professor Quaik. Um, let me look at the questions. One of them is, what are the plans to use this technology in disease states like cancer, autoimmune diseases, chronic diseases, neurodegenerative diseases, etc.? cetera? So, so the question is, how are they used in specific disease questions? Uh, what are the plans to have all this information? Oh, the plans. Oh, yeah. I mean, so we kind of established essentially normal aging plus normal kind of baseline data sets. And then I think you can layer on top of those all kinds of different disease states. And, you know, people who are disease experts in their tissues will do that. Um, and uh, it's already happening. I mean, you know, there, there's been a lot of uh, excellent work around the world of people looking at tissues in disease. Cancer has been a big one up till now, um, for sure. Uh, and, uh, and, you know, there's going to be an opportunity to integrate all this together. And, you know, there's a lot left to do, put it that way. In mouse, because you have so many disease models, 
you'll be able to lay them on top. Human is a little more challenging, but um, in some cases, I think it'll be possible. I see. Did you, uh, like, same line of thought, did you look into, can you do cancer stem cell analysis? Just pick one, uh, which is quite you know popular these days, look into cancer stem cells and do succin. Oh, yeah. Those. Yeah, that's a great question. That's how it all started. That's what Mike Clark and I were doing back in 2011 when we were first, you know, I referenced a paper there early on. Um, when we, before we were even sequencing, we were using highly parallel PCR because we were looking at tumors and looking at the subpopulations there to try to figure out which were the stem cells, what were their molecular properties, and which aspects of them would, would, would which of those, uh, what were the interesting drug targets there that you could develop drugs against that would specifically target cancer stem cells. And there's a great whole story behind that about a company we founded called Quanacell. And it's got two molecules in the clinic right now in phase two trials of BMS that resulted from all that. And so um, we're, we're hopefully going to learn something about whether that whole approach has been successful in the next year or two. Thank you. One other person says, terrific talk. I'm wondering if Quake Lab has explored any human microbiome and its crosstalk with host cells in the context of host microbiome atlas. Yes, so that's another good question. And we do have a microbiome group, both on the mouse and the you know, tabula muris and the tabula sapiens. And in that uh, tabula sapiens preprint, you'll see a little analysis of the microbiome, which is about to get quite a bit more beefed up in our, in our resubmission in the next version. And so, yeah, we're very interested in how the microbiome interacts and, and how those things work together. Thank you. Do you account for transcriptome redundancies as signal or noise? Transcriptome redundancies? Yes. Or I'm not sure what they mean by that, but I, I will take a stab at it. Um, you know, it's known that there are certain artifacts when you do dissociation. So some genes, their expression is going to change um, due to the, you know, the stress of dissociation. Um, and those have been studied separately and we pull them out of the analysis. So we try to remove things that are known artifacts um and 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 separate them out and perhaps that's the the question i see i think um we have heard about this 23 and me uh regarding 23 and me when people do that they give you certain percentages do you think over time it can be improved that they can locate it to one city or get finer in the analysis um Regarding 23andMe and the future, what is the future of this technology? Where do you think? Uh, 23andMe separately or with single cell transcriptomics? Uh, 23 separately. Oh, separately, got it. Um, yeah, you know, this whole consumer genetics thing is terrific uh, from my perspective. Not everybody likes it. I'm a fan of it. You know, I, I think people should be empowered to explore their genome and find out what it means to them. There's obviously um, some questions about you know, when you start crossing over to diagnostics, you want to be careful about that, not to, not to be uh, uh, running afoul of some of the more subtle clinical uh, issues around that. But in terms of understanding ancestry and things like that, I think it's terrific. Thank you. Did you look at the relation between gene expression or transcriptomics and function? Yes. I mean, that was sort of the point of doing parabiosis. Um, where, you know, we would either rejuvenate or accelerate aging um, and try to understand uh, uh, whether the transcriptomes were faithful um, uh, kind of uh, mirrors of that and providing insight into these functional changes. And we found to a large extent it was. I see. Um, still looking for more questions, but, you know, that's all the questions I have, sir. I uh, appreciate uh, one second, one other thing. As a prospective student, Professor, would you mind telling us about your plans to investigate in this field? My plans going forward? Yeah. Yeah, you know, I mean, we're going to finish the Tabula Sapiens. Um, we're continuing to ask questions um, that are very specifically focused, like the memory work. There's a whole other generation of experiments on that that I'm very excited about. And we're spending a lot of time thinking about what these atlases mean in terms of asking questions about the evolution of multicellularity. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. It was a fantastic talk, Steve. I appreciate it. Thank your you. Time. Pleasure to connect. Thank you.